Um, well, hi everyone, welcome. I'm Jory Sheriff, Senior Manager for Membership Initiatives at the museum. And I know I say this before each and every program, uh, but thank you all so much for being members and for your generosity and for staying connected to the museum during this time. We're truly so grateful. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce our special guests today, Stacy and Elliot Science. Welcome, Stacy and Elliot. <laughs> Um, it's really wonderful to have you both here. Um, for those of you who may not know, Stacy is a dedicated Museum of Jewish Heritage trustee whose work with us has really pushed forward our mission of Holocaust education and remembrance. Um, and Elliot is just as accomplished in this area as well. Um, Elliot, you're 15 now, right? So five years ago when Elliot was just 10, he and his family with the help of HBO created an incredibly moving documentary about his great grandfather, Jack Feldman, who is a Holocaust survivor with a truly remarkable story. Um, in just a moment, we'll show the short film. It's about 20 minutes long, and we'll learn more about Jack's life and Elliot's relationship with his great grandfather. Um, and after the screening, please stick around. We'll have a discussion with Elliot and Stacy about the film, and you're all welcome to submit your questions into the chat at that time. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen and start the film. This is the story of Sherlock Feldman, my great-grandfather. He was put in the Nazi death camps during World War II. This is the close-up of his number from Auschwitz, A17606. That was his number. And he told us back then, your number was your name. That was all he was to them. old. This is a picture of my family. I have my dad, my mom, and there's my brother, Jared. This is my great-grandfather. He is a Holocaust survivor. We see him every summer and whenever we come visit. We play games hang out, read our books together. And this is one of his hats. He loves wearing hats. Every time I go to the store, I buy a hat. I buy another hat. I keep buying. I say, how many hats do you need? I say, well, I like those hats. As far as I can remember, I've been asking him questions. He's good at storytelling. We talk about all kinds of things. My favorite topic to usually talk to him about would be what he did before the war. Who's that? That's my daddy. That's your dad? Yeah, my daddy, and that's my aunt. That's Sammy. Sammy and Sammy, the, that's so that me. must be you and Sally? That's my wife, Sally. I had a big family. Can you tell me a story about where you're from? Like where, where I was born? born? Yeah, where are you? I was born in Poland. Like where in Poland? 
Where the name the town Shostnoviets. Was it pretty or what? Oh yeah, nice place. We live good there. Did you go to school? Sure, I went to school. What'd you do for fun? I went to watch the soccer game. Well, a happy life. We have a good family. We were very close. In summertime, we went for vacation. It was a good life. What did your father do as his job? He was a cap maker. He made hats. That was his business. He was very successful. And Saturday, everybody went to temple. My father dressed up elegant with a nice hat. He was a smart man. He was young, but he was smart. Did you ever learn how to drive a car? Drive a car? <laughs> we have a horse, not a car. <laughs> we have no cars. <laughs> Great, Poppy told me there was always trouble for Jews, but your religion didn't really matter back then, till the Nazis came. In Germany, there was a lot of problems going on, and Adolf Hitler made a big speech and said, oh, the Jews are causing all the problems. If we kill all the Jews, then we're gonna have no more problems. They say, well, Hitler's coming to you. That was very nasty. Most of the Jews are scared. They didn't want to get hurt. Do you remember seeing any of this? Like, see, like, the burning temple? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what this was? Jews were forced to wear a yellow star. You have to wear this. You put this right over here. He used to wear that. Why? When you walk on the street, they know you're Jewish. Did you have to do that to your store? Yeah. Wait on all the windows, Jews? The you word. did. That's a, that's a Jew. There were people chucking rocks at Jewish people's stores only because they were Jewish. My great-grandfather, it was really hard for him. He got kicked out of school because he was Jewish. The German came in and they rounded us up. and they sent us to the ghetto. We left everything home. They couldn't take nothing with you. The ghetto was a little area where they crammed a huge bunch of Jews in there, forced them to live in there. We had maybe 15 or 20 people sleeping in one room. I slept on the floor. They lost their homes, they lost their possessions, they lost their money, they lost their businesses, they lost everything. What happened after you were in the ghetto? I was walking with my friends on the street. I was young, 14. Then the German with the car pulled off and they grabbed me and they took me away. Did they grab any of your friends? Yeah. All of them? All of them. And they put me in a room. My mother and father, I looked at the window 
I only see my father. My mother, she didn't come because she was heartbroken. My father came in, he said like that, goodbye. He told me, you young, you go to work. We don't know what will happen to us over here. And he was right. You know what happened to your father? That happened, no. I never saw him, I never knew it, what happened. I never knew what happened to my mother and my father. I never saw him again. The Nazis wanted to take over all of Europe. And so they invaded one country after another. They planned to kill every single Jewish person in Europe. Did it scare you? Scare me? Sure they scare me. I always hope I go see my parents again. I always think about them. When the Nazis captured you from the ghetto, what'd they do? They transferred me. They put me on the train. To where? To the camp. They sent me from one camp to the other one. When I was in Fallbrook labor camp, my father sent me this hat. My father did a lot of business with the German people, and they brought this in for me. I knew it why he sent me the, the hat. Right here, he put the money in, you see? Right here was open. When I got it, I opened up, and I found the money right there. But I couldn't do nothing with the money. You couldn't buy nothing in the camp. So I took the money out, and I give it to the headman from the camp, that he give me some food, and he treat me better. Great Poppy says the extra food and stuff that he got from the money is how he survived. Finally, they sent me to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a death camp or a concentration camp. Concentration camp was a place where they kept them behind a bunch of electric fences so they wouldn't escape and they had guards around the electric fence with guns to shoot them if they tried to escape. When I arrived in the camp, they put this number. They didn't call me Jack. They didn't call me my name, they called a the number. So they weren't who they really were, they were just numbers. When he was at the death camps, they were like slaves. They didn't care for them. Like the Nazis made them dig holes just to make them work. They did one little mistake, and they got caught. They just like shoot them, kill them. We dig uh, the ground, you know what I mean? We don't know for what. No peace. You want to lay down and sleep? They call you. They don't know peace. What did you eat there? Soup, water. On a Sunday, they give you a piece of bread. Were you like skinny? 
skinny, like skinny, skinny, my feet were skinny, my whole body was skinny. How did you get out of Auschwitz? The Germans started to lose the war and they wanted to run away. They took us and we marched for six months, walking, walking every night, every day and night, without food, without shoes. A lot of people couldn't make it. Thousands and thousands of people just died. If you stopped or like went off course, shot you, dug up a hole, threw you in the hole. We walk in till May. May 5th, I was liberated by the Russians. When the Russians left, the American came in. After the war, he went back to his hometown. No one was there. Did you find anyone? In my hometown, I didn't find nobody. That's why I left. He went to Germany to live there in a displaced persons camp. And he got married. And then he went on a boat. When he got to America, the funny thing is, he thought his name wasn't fancy enough. So he changed his name to Jack. And then opened up Jack's Fish Market. Hi, Bobby. You see the fish? Yeah. That's, so that's Papi's fish. store. What yeah. time is it? It's time for lunch. I like the grouper. You like grouper? Yeah. And you, what do you like? Salmon. Salmon. Let me find out if they have salmon. This is the only place that we know that you can get something to eat if you ain't got no money. This is his number right here. And he knows exactly what it means to be hungry. So therefore, if anybody hungry, he will feed them, if you got money or not. His stories have like changed a lot of people. The way they think, the way they act. You need to know it to understand, to stop it from happening in future generations. They say in like a year or two, there's gonna be like no survivors left. And so we're trying to get all their stories, all the information before they pass away. He's a hero to most people for how he survived and stuff. I know he's my family's hero. Thank you so much for, for being here and for help, you know, allowing us to see this really beautiful film. I am personally really struck by the connection that you, Elliot, and your great-grandfather have. It's very tender and just so sweet. I mean, I know you're, you're obviously a little bit older now. I mean, how do you feel watching this now as, as an older person? What, what's your relationship with your your grandfather like yeah. um well it's still very much the same you know very strong loving relationship and looking back at it it's nice because I see it so many times that every time I can just you know always have that refresher of his story always be keeping it alive not only through other people but through myself um making it more and more clear in my mind every time I watch it absolutely I, I also just want to say even as a young child you know, you're able to communicate so clearly why, tell, you know, why telling the story is so important. I mean, what, what kinds of work have you been doing, you know, since this film has, has been released to further communicate the importance of, of doing work like this? Um, since the film's release, I've been able to take it similar to this, doing Q and A's and different panels uh, all over before COVID, I went to the Krakow Jewish Film Festival um, 
Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, uh, New York Film Festival, Rochester. different temples in Rochester, New York City, all across um, the state and America, different churches even. And, and just anywhere I could go to help spread this message and show the film and share his story. Before the program, Elliot and Stacey and I were talking about kinds of just the kinds of questions that people may have asked you after seeing this film. Can you share some, some stories about you know, what questions other kids had for you after having seen this? Well, you know, there's, there's just so many because what's so nice about going to all these different places is in every place and every school and every time you go somewhere or call on a different person, it's a different question. It's a different experience because it resonates differently with everyone. And that's something so important to be able to go around and share it with everyone and personally connect with them and be able to answer their questions. Uh, some people have questions on the basic history of it. Some people have more in-depth questions about his story, how he survived, how other people survived in relation to his story. Uh, just a any question you can imagine, it's been asked or it's a question I can never think up until it's asked. This is a question for both of you, I think, but you know, we're seeing an increase in Holocaust denial um, and also anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry. Um, what do you say to people who, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but wh what would you say to someone who doesn't believe that the Holocaust existed? Subscribe um, to you, both of you. Now for someone who doesn't believe that the Holocaust exists, it is obviously very, very clearly misinformed or filled with hate. And that's something that needs to change. It's something that I would try, I haven't personally encountered it, but I would try and show them testimony have them sit down and actually speak to a survivor and say to their face, how can you say to their face that they're making this up when it's something so clear, so deep, so emotional um, to speak about, to have experienced that there's, there's just no making this up. As, um, as many people say, you know, the Holocaust was such, such a powerful event. And to hear these stories firsthand from the survivor or a video of the firsthand survivor speaking about their experience, it's just so powerful. And to deny that is something so wrong because it's so, it's so clear, you, you just can't, you can't make up how atrocious this truly was. Absolutely. And Stacey, I'm curious, had you and Jack ever spoken about his, his story, his history you know, prior to when Elliot approached him? Absolutely. So I was an inquisitive um, youngster around when you know, around the same age as Ellie. As soon as I had a camera, um, I was constantly asking my grandfather questions and filming him. And you know, over the years, it, I, I continued to do so, and I continued to research my family's history. And eventually, when I turned forty, I went to Poland, and I was able to visit the town where he was, and I was able to visit Auschwitz, and I was able to visit the town where my grandmother was from, and the camp that she was in. And, um, and that's actually how the film came together because I had put together just a little unprofessional film for my family so that we would have his story. And when I was at an event at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, um, uh, Sheila Evans, who's the head of HBO Documentary, uh, had approached me because she was looking for somebody who had a survivor in their family and had children um, to have this special conversation. And so I was able to give her my unprofessional film that was only for my family's eyes so she could see my grandfather. And so, yes, I've always asked him the questions my entire life. Which is why I think it's my son, you know, both Elliot and my other son, Jared, were able to feel so comfortable asking him questions as well. This brings up a point that I had thought about, you know, after watching this, as I'm sure you both know, and as I'm sure members know, there are many survivors who are reluctant to share their stories because they say it's just too painful to talk about. And of course, we, we want to be respectful of this. And at the same time, these stories are just so important to hear and to tell. Um, I'm curious to hear your perspectives. You know, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in bringing up this subject with a family member who's a survivor and who may be reluctant to share their story? Um, now, I haven't really thought about this before, but maybe 
maybe try and start it small. Maybe instead of first asking about the Holocaust, first ask about, ask about their family, ask about their hometown, ask about how they grew up and the life that they led before the Holocaust. And maybe by getting that and getting down on that emotional connection, they'll be able to open up and talk about what did happen to their family, what did happen to their hometown, and eventually build up to saying the, their own story. And so maybe just starting small, starting with the happier memories that they cherish mm -hmm. is something that you might want to do. That's really good advice, I think, to, to start small and ease into the conversation. And I know for our family, at least, my grandfather, when he and my grandmother moved to the United States, they just wanted to kind of put the past behind them and give their children a happy life. And so my grandparents never really spoke about the Holocaust with their kids. And my father and his siblings, they knew about the Holocaust because my grandfather would have, and my grandparents would have their friends who are all Holocaust survivors come over every Sunday night and they call them the card players and they would play cards and they would speak in Yiddish. And that's when they would all reminisce and talk about um, things that happened in the Holocaust. So my father and his siblings knew, and they also would hear my grandfather and my grandmother having nightmares at night. And so they never really wanted to ask because they didn't want them to feel bad. And my grandparents, their view was we want to give our children such a good life. And so they didn't want to burden them with it. And so I think because I'm a generation below and Elliot as well, it was a lot easier for my grandfather to open up to me because I know it now as a parent, you want to protect your children. And so I think, you know, with that distant, that generational distance, it was a lot easier for my grandfather to tell me all the details. And obviously, once he started talking about it, my father and his siblings were also able to speak to him and get details. Um, but I think it was, you know, both time and also that generational distance. It really struck me also just having watched the film and seeing your great grandfather's, you know, physical, his, his own artifacts and his objects, that and the animation, I guess it was watercolor animation. Can you talk about how they came up with this, with this story and this visual aspect? Uh, well, the visual aspects, those are real, real images of the Holocaust. Those are actual footage and actual images. And there's this artistic technique known as rotoscoping where, um, the artist for the film, Jeff Shear, he would have and be given these actual images for, from the museum, actually. And he would rotoscope over them, which is similar to watercoloring, in which he would make all these different frames and he would make it flow in watercolor these images that still give you the real image, still give you that impact, but on a lighter way, because you're not, you're not seeing the actual person, but, but you are. Like you're seeing it through the watercolor and that sense of artistic, um, like the our artistic softness is just a lot easier on kids and a lot easier to look at and take in, but also still taking in, you know, the exact content, the real, you're taking in the real thing, but on a soft, on a softened scale. Right. No, that, that makes sense. And I think in that way, it's probably more accessible for younger children who maybe this is their first introduction to hearing about the Holocaust. I think it's a really nice teaching tool and it's just as impactful for adults as well, I have to say. Um, we have some questions in the chat from members. Please feel free to keep asking your questions. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, um, someone wanted to know on, on a different note, what did your grand, great grandfather ever tell you specifically what, what kinds of work he was forced to do in, in Auschwitz? Well, yes. Yeah, so he um, he had to dig a lot of holes. We know that. And then actually, when my grandfather arrived in Auschwitz, he was for Mengele pointed for him to go to the line for the gas. And there was a man, his father before the war owned a hat company. And the person who was uh, in charge right beneath his father actually was a capo at the camp. And when my grandfather arrived at the camp and was pointed to the line for the gas, this capo pull, saw my grandfather, pulled him out of that line and put him in the line for work. And in addition to doing that, he assigned my grandfather an extra job. So every all day he'd have to go dig holes and do whatever it was they assigned to him. But at the end of the day, instead of going back to his barracks, he would have to clean a Nazi officer's room 
And he says that this job actually is part of the reason he survived because in cleaning the room, he would have access to the extra scraps of food that were left. And he would eat those and bring those back as well for his friends. And he said that that provided him the nourishment that you know helped him survive Auschwitz. Can you explain just for people who may not know what a capo is? Yeah. So during the Holocaust, the Nazi officers would appoint these people known as capos and capos were still Jewish prisoners in the camps, but they were given more responsibilities and duties to oversee um, the other Jews and basically be a Nazi. Um, and if they disobeyed, they would, you know, be sent. I forget exactly what would happen, but uh, they were basically just these Jewish prisoners that were given higher a higher role an overseeing role in the camp to make it flow better and take less work uh, off the nazis the nazis would be able to do more work um more work elsewhere and have to do less overseeing uh over the jews and mm -hmm. the camp i mean in, in spite of all of this just from i mean i haven't met i haven't met jack but just from watching the video he seems so resilient and there's definitely a joy to him which to me is so remarkable given everything he's been through i mean can can you talk about what his personality is like <laughs> he's extremely he's so he is he's extremely happy for somebody who has gone through the worst horror you can ever imagine and lost his entire family. He's such a happy, loving, giving person. And, you know, he, he was one of those people that he couldn't bear to see anyone without food. And he would give food to people, you know, without them paying for it because he just couldn't bear to see hunger. And he is, he's, he's as happy as you see him in that. He's, that's as happy as he is today. He's much happier now that um, some of the COVID restrictions have let up and he's able to be a little bit more social again. And um, yeah, he, he's very happy and he feels appreciative, you know, that he survived and that he's able to have this large loving family, so. Um, we have a question from, and who wants to know um, how did he meet his wife? Okay, so um, after the war, there were all of these different, as it said, there were these different um, displaced persons camps established around Germany and other places by the Russians, Americans, supplying aid and shelter and just a place to go for all of these different people who had been put out of their homes during the war and had no place to turn, nowhere to go back to. And so the, there were these different um, just basic aid places set up where they would live and have their own little community. And in one of these, and he married his wife in that community, but before they got there, he went back to his hometown, just as many other people did, to see and go to his home and see if there was anything left, to see if he could, you know, maybe stay there or just have a photo of his family, see if his family had made it out and survived. But when he went there, there was nothing there. And he went and looked to the other town where most of his family lived, his cousins, his uncles, aunts. And in going to look for that town, he did end up finding one of his cousins. And this cousin had survived the war with who would be his future, the woman who would be his future wife. And they were, um, they were together and when my great grandfather came and found his cousin and found her, they all went to the displaced persons camp together. And so he met her through the cousin and then lived with her in the displaced persons camp where they fell in love and got married. It has, does, he, does he have any friends you know, in the area from, from this time? Is he able to, to stay in touch? So sadly, he's 95 and most of his survivor friends, he did have, he had, the reason he ended up in Rochester is because some of his friends that he met after the war in the displaced persons camp went to Rochester, New York, and that's why they sponsored him, you know, helped him get sponsored and he followed. So, but sadly, most of them have since passed away. Um, and, you know, this is the importance of sharing these kinds of stories and Elliot, you spoke really so well about just the mission of the museum and the importance of carrying on these stories from generation to generation. 
Um, has Jack seen, was he able to, to see the Auschwitz exhibit at the museum when it was on view? And what, what was uh, his reaction? I do, I do actually remember this because this, this was years ago, I believe. No, 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 no. They're not too long. About, no, they're talking about the Auschwitz exhibit. But he did, Which he exhibit? didn't get to come to see the Auschwitz exhibit, unfortunately, at the museum. He was planning to, and then when COVID hit, you know, he, right. stopped, he traveled. So he didn't see the Auschwitz exhibit. But the thing about my grandfather is, you know, Absolutely. we always talk about, um, you know, when there's a new movie that comes out and he'll say, oh, I was there. I already know it all. But then he ultimately will come with, you know, the boys and I to see something. And then every time he does, more stories come out of him and he shares them with us. But unfortunately, he did not have an opportunity to see the Auschwitz exhibit before it left the museum. I forget exactly which exhibit I was thinking about. But. <laughs> I think, well, Elliot was probably thinking about, he was at the museum for the premiere of the movie. And at the time they had Jeff Shear's uh, artwork on display. And so he loved walking around and looking at it. Um, Elliot, I'm just you know curious about what, what upcoming projects you have. And I know you're really passionate about this topic and, and about Holocaust education. Do you have anything on the horizon? you're planning? Well, um, just like this, I go to many different schools and try and speak to children because children are so, so important to teach about this because it, it's so important to learn about this young and to really have some sort of understanding going into the real world, knowing that there's this type of hate out there and knowing that you need to be able to see it and be able to combat it, which is the museum's goal and a goal of mine as well to help people understand that and be able to be ready for that. And so to go to different schools, which I actually get to do on Wednesday, I get to go to my cousin's school actually in Staten Island. And I get to speak to many different kids, do a similar showing the film, have a Q and A and get to speak to them and influence them on learning about how different hate can affect people, where hate can lead even on such a small scale, just one, one person's hate on a small scale expanding outwards like this, you can see how, just how terrible it can be and why it needs to be combated, which is something so important for the real world and even so important just in the school community to deal with bullying and, uh, you know, different kind of minor hates in the school, which can inevitably lead to be so much worse. So it's so important to teach different kids about this and help them understand and be educated. And it's one thing to learn about it in a textbook and to have a teacher how to explain the Holocaust, but to hear from a witness and a survivor directly is really something else entirely. So we're just so grateful to the both of you for being here today and for you know allowing us to share your great grandfather's story. We're really appreciative. Thanks for having us. Well, of course. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, but we will, we've recorded this program if you'd like to take another look at the film uh, another time again. So um, I just want to say again, thank you both so much. We're so grateful, Stacey, that you're a trustee. It's so meaningful. And Elliot, of course, your work is just really impactful and, and remarkable for someone so young. So thank you so much. And thank you all for being members. We're just, we're very grateful.